This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And welcome, folks, to another edition of Open Mic Night. I'm your host, Noah Taluki. And on today's episode, the Tigers with the 2021 MLB Draft on Sunday and really continuing today as well. We'll break down the top picks that the Tigers made in the draft. Also, a special guest joining us later, Casey Fitzsimmons, if anybody remembers. He played seven seasons at tight end for the Lions from 2003 to 2009. All three of the seasons that Dan Campbell was a player for the Lions, he played with him. He was in the the same meeting room and all that at the tight end position. So he will join us later to talk some Lions football and some of his experiences that he had playing with Dan Campbell, among others. So hopefully everybody had a great weekend out there. Really, really pumped for the podcast today, especially with Casey Fitzsimmons coming on later. And last night, the Home Run Derby happened. I mean, I'll just say, I love watching the Home Run Derby, and it's one of my favorite parts of baseball, and it's just fun. It's fun to see how how hard, how high, and and you know how long these guys can hit it, and especially with the increased altitude in uh, Colorado, you know, some of them even flew even, even further. I think they said it was about a 20, 25 foot increase with the altitude on those home runs. So it was a lot of fun. I predicted Pete Alonzo would win. I didn't think Otani would. Uh, I, I actually thought it would be Soto uh, who who would beat him, at least in the first round. And uh, I, I, I had a feeling it was just there's too much hype and, and too much buzz. Plus, he was pitching in the All-Star game. The next day, you know, today. So I, I'm, uh, I was really happy for the polar bear. I like him. He's he plays with an edge, and you know, he's just got a really low key demeanor. And I'll tell you what, his coach was really pitching it well. I mean, he was pitching it right in the zone, right in his happy spot. They they call it happy zone, whatever. And he uh, he delivered a performance unlike any other. So back to back home run derby champion uh, Pete Alonso. I will say. So I have shared my experience before. Uh, meeting Tim Tebow, I was able to get a picture with him and, and all that a couple years ago in Akron when he played for the Rubber Duck, or I'm sorry, when they played the Rubber Ducks, uh, when he played for the Binghamton Rumble Ponies, and one of his teammates at the time was Pete Alonzo, and I remember watching the game, and the guy was like four for four, he was hitting over 400 on the season, and I thought to myself, this guy's going to play in the majors one day, and it's funny because walking out of the locker room after the game, all the fans are waiting for Tim Tebow, I see Pete Alonzo walking out, and there's one guy that wants his autograph. One. <laughs> Looking back, I probably should have asked for it or gotten a picture or something like that with him. But uh, it was it was just kind of funny because everybody was there to see Tim Tebow, even though the guy who actually made it to the MLB and the guy that's an actual All Star and now two time defending home run derby champ, one guy wanted his autograph. I, I thought it was funny. One of my better memories of watching a minor league baseball. That's for sure. All right. So I do want to talk a little Tigers before we get into Casey Fitzsimmons. I, you know, so there's a lot of buzz out there about this number three overall pick that the Tigers made in, in Jackson Job. He's a pitcher from Heritage Hall High School in Oklahoma City. They're a very prestigious private school. I would probably compare it to like a Country Day or or Cranbrook, you know, one of those type of schools that's that's very prestigious in the Oklahoma City area, very respected. Wes Welker went to school there. So did uh, Barry Sanders' son. So even, you know, there's a Detroit tie right there. But regardless, Jackson Job, look, I know everybody wants to hate on the pick and all that, but I have a strategy and I I have a theory that I think is why the Tigers picked him at number three. Now, look, am I a fan of picking a high school pitcher that high? Eh, you know, it, it's it, it's risky. I, I would have rather taken a college arm. I, I thought going in that the Tigers would take Kumar Rocker, but for some odd reason, he was moving down the, the mock drafts, and it was really interesting, but all the mock drafts seemed to be blown up. I mean, I think the number one overall pick the, that went to the Pirates, I you know, I don't think a lot of people had him as the number one overall pick. Uh, you, you know, so it, I, I definitely thought, so looking at it, I'm texting my uncle during the draft. I was watching the first couple picks, and I thought, well, we need a we need a pitcher, I think, and I, I but I would rather have take a college arm or you know, let, let's go with the shortstop. Now, I, I'm going to be honest. I didn't know too much about the shortstop prospects. Uh, I, and, and, I mean, looking back, there's a lot of them. There's a, a lot of talented shortstops. Uh, Marcelo Mayer was the one that went to Boston, fourth overall, the next pick, who a lot of people say he's a stud. 
and uh, he he'll be a true pro one day. But a lot of people questioning the Jackson Job pick. Now, the, my thought is: look, high school baseball is completely different than professional baseball. We all know it's 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 completely different than college baseball. This guy throwing ninety nine miles an hour fastball. He's got a nice slider, all that. That's great. But can that translate over to the professional game, especially if he's eighteen years old? You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of risk there. This is a guy. I, I just I don't know how how ready he'll be. I don't know. I mean, I'll admit I don't know a whole lot about him, but just based on the, the you know some of the stuff I've watched and all that, I just we'll see how well he progresses. I mean, there, there's already a lot of pressure put on him. I mean, right off the bat, people were hating the pick and all that, and. You know, coming to a, a a town with a lot of base a sports tradition and you know, a lot of people just hungry for a winner. There's a there's a big bullseye on his back. You know, there he's gonna have to perform, especially being the number three overall pick. I just wonder how long it's gonna take. Is it gonna take a couple years if he's really that good? Is it going to be five or six years before he you know puts on the old English D? I I, I really don't know. There's just a lot of question marks, but, and you know, a lot of people want to hate Alavila for it. And, you know, some, some of that, some of that probably is the right blame. I mean, there has been some questionable moves that Alice had as general manager, but like I said before, I think there's a strategy behind this. Now you think about it, the Tigers, you know, a lot of people wanted them to draft the shortstop. There was a lot of the angry fans out there. And granted, look, I don't know how many fans out there really pay attention to the MLB draft. I mean, I think I think just a couple of the the experts were talking about it, and then it kind of blew up. Well, it was obvious to to take the shortstop. I don't think any of these people going in knew uh, fans. I'm not talking about the experts, the fans, because it's like, was there any hype around who the Tigers were going to take? No, it's not like the NFL where you know there's there's a guy. That especially if you have a top ten pick, there's a guy that you really want. You know, it's not, it's not like in baseball; it's different. I don't know many fans that really think like that, but I think that there is a strategy here. And I'm just this is a prediction. But watching the home run derby yesterday, I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of free agent shortstops out there this year. I mean, you think of, I mean, right off the bat, you got Marcus Semyon, Trevor Story, who competed in the home run derby, and they talked about how. He might be a, one of those midseason guys that that gets traded. I mean, he's only twenty nine. Corey Seager, twenty eight years old from the Dodgers. Brandon Crawford, he's old. Uh, Carlos Correa, Javier Baez. I mean, there's some quality names out there that are shortstops. And my theory is is that the Tigers backed off from drafting the shortstop that high. Now they did end up taking a shortstop later on. They actually uh, they took a guy in the second round by the name of Isaac Pacheco, shortstop and third baseman from Friendswood High School in Texas. So another high schooler. By the way, their second pick was Ty Madden, pitcher from Texas. I think that guy could be good. I think I think he could be. He's he definitely has a lot of potential, for sure. I think I think there's a lot less questions with Ty Madden than there is with Jackson Joe. But hey, you can't have enough pitching. You can't have enough pitching. I mean, I think that's why the Tigers went very pitcher heavy, at least through the first 10 rounds at the time of this recording. I mean, Job, Ty Madden, Dylan Smith from Alabama, Tyler Madison from Bryant, Tanner Colehep from Notre Dame, Brant Herder from Georgia Tech, Jordan Marks from South Carolina Upstate, Garrett Burhen from Ohio State. So those are the pitchers so far. They've, so they've definitely gone pitcher heavy. At least they have their shortstop if they want it. If, if he pans out, Isaac, I'm about to say Isaac Paredes, Isaac Pacheco. So my theory is that the Tigers, they're going to spend. They're going to get someone at the trade deadline or they're going to get somebody in the offseason because of all these free agents. Why Why would you take you know, a, a shortstop if he's going to be ready in a couple years when you're going to have one of these free agent shortstops for a while? That's that's my theory on it. I don't know if this is how the Tigers are really thinking about it, but I think it's very possible that the Tigers go out and get a guy like Carlos Correa, Javi Baez, Trevor Story, a guy that's, you know, in their late 20s, 
and kind of in the prime of their career might need a, a change of scenery, if you will. I mean, especially Carlos Correa. I mean, you think about it, all the success that he had with A.J. Hinch. I mean, it, it would make the most sense if Carlos Correa came to Detroit. You know, a, you know, a guy that's a real locked out, a superstar, and that's what this team needs, a superstar. So I, I could see the Tigers taking any of these guys. Probably my favorite right now is probably Correa, but... I mean, you never know. Free agency is the wild, wild west. You, you never know what's going to happen there. But that's my theory. I think that's why the Tigers decided to take Job. This is a guy with a lot of upside. There's a lot of talent there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I just don't know how much, how fast it's going to translate to the MLB level. Is it, is, is it going to take just a couple years? I mean, JV, you know, he was ready in just a year or two, year, year and a half. I mean, granted, he was a college arm. But there's guys that, you know, their their maturity takes a little longer than others. And with the number three overall pick, you expect that guy to be ready in just a year or two. So we'll we'll see what happens, but I, I don't hate on the pick, Tiger fans. I think it's part of a greater plan, but I, I questioned it at the beginning, too. I, I did. Just my initial reaction was, why are we taking a high school arm? You know, there's there's a couple other you know, needs that maybe we have to address a little bit more. But in the end, you can't have enough pitching. This guy does have a lot of potential. You know, he's a top 10 pick, rightfully so. Ty Madden was even supposed to be a top 10 pick in some mock drafts. So that's another guy. You know, so don't be, don't worry, Tigers fans. Everybody out there is just, they're hungry for something, and, and when they see some, when they see a wrong decision that they think, then they, they go crazy. Don't, don't freak out, guys. I think I think I think the Tigers are up to something here, and hopefully it'll be for the positive. AJ, you got to remember, guys. AJ Hinge is a smart manager. Now Al Avila and Chris Illich, it's been some question marks, but at least they have a smart manager in AJ Hinch. I'm ho- and AJ Hinch. We you know Jake Biding was on before uh, he, the former strength and conditioning coach for the Astros. We had him on back when AJ Hinch was hired. He said. AJ has had a lot of experience working in the front office before. He'll be able to communicate really well with the front office people. So my point is, is that if AJ wants something, he'll I think he'll be able to know how to communicate that to Al, and they can both agree on it. That's what I'm. That's what I'm hoping for for the Tigers to do for sure. All right, want to get into this interview with Casey Fitzsimmons. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, it's really really good interview and uh, definitely a, a guy that uh, has a lot of experience and a really an amazing story, you know, coming from an NAIA school and uh, talking about what he's up to these days as well out in his hometown state. So here's the interview with Casey Fitzsimmons. And joining us now here on the Open Mic Night podcast is Casey Fitzsimmons. He was a seven-year tight end with the Lions from 2003 to 2009, also played with a Dan Campbell the newest uh, Lions head coach, and also Matthew Stafford uh, in his rookie year in 2009. Casey, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so, uh, you know, when we were uh, talking back and forth, uh, you were telling me that, you know, you're, you're doing uh, ranching now in, in Montana. I just, I, I want to know, you know, how, uh, how's the ranching life been for you, and uh, how'd, you, how'd you get into it? It's good. You know, we, uh, it's, I love it because I get to, you know, work with my family, be around my kids, my wife all the time. Um, really don't see a whole lot of people. It's a little different lifestyle than the previous one, but um, I'm enjoying it. Um, you know, raising cattle and, and feeding America is is just as rewarding as, as playing on Sunday. So um, when I got into it, I just, uh, as a child, I, I guess I always wanted to run cattle when I got old enough. And, and I always used football as a source or a means to, to be able to purchase a ranch. And, um, so my, when I got done in our 2008, we purchased a place. And then, uh, when I got home, we bought some cows and started with 30 and now we're running 250. So it's been quite a, quite a journey. There's been some learning curves, but you know, like if you want to be successful at anything, I guess just listen to the people that are involved and been doing it for a long time and then taking their ideas and and the, their way of doing it, you know, it allows you to, to implement it into your operation and, and hopefully be successful. Speaking of football, of course, uh, you know, seven years 
with the Lions, but you started out playing an eight-man football in high school at Chester uh, for the, the Coyotes, very, very small town uh, in Montana. You know, really undersized your whole career. You actually started out playing basketball, though, I heard, and uh, you want to be a college basketball player, but then uh, then you got into football. How did, how did that come around? Well, it's kind of funny. I made a bet with the kid back in high school that he had to play basketball if I went out for football. And, um, you know, looking back on it, had I not done it, obviously there would have been a big regret because I think in, in high school you should probably participate in every athletic event or athletic sport that you possibly can just to, one, stay busy, healthy, active, and and learn, you know, a bunch of stuff from it because I think sports bring so much as far as life skills, you know, the winning, the losing, the team aspect, um, the accountability. I mean, there's so much beneficial, um, things from athletics and, and, uh, you know, so thank God, you know, my, my buddy's name was Ryan Gagne and thank God, you know, we made the bet. He didn't, uh, didn't go out for basketball but it worked out all right for me so um I'm happy with the decision that uh that I made so then uh you know eventually you get to uh Carroll College a very small catholic uh, college in uh, Helena Montana at NAIA and uh, you know I was I was reading a little bit you you kind of revolutionized the tight end position in in the frontier conference you know you uh you know a lot of teams are running uh, a lot of different you know four wides and all that but you really brought the the tight end position back and, uh, you know, three time all American over there as well. And, and conference MVP and, uh, voted the best tight end in Montana history as well. Part of your illustrious career there. So, you know, how did your time at Carroll college, you know, you know, formed, a, how you, uh, ended up, you know, making it to the NFL. Well, you know, like revolution. Everybody was going to the spread offense. I, I, when I recall, Rocky Mountain College over in Billings um, had real good success with the the Short brothers. They uh, they were winning the Frontier Conference. They were going deep into the playoffs, and so I think you know, like anybody in football, everything's kind of copycatted. And so when I came in, and I wasn't the number one recruited tight end in, at Carroll, so you know, my whole career has kind of been one of those things where. I've always kind of been the odd man out and had to work my way into a position. But, you know, all I ever asked for growing or going in my athletic career was just an opportunity. And, and when I, cause I knew if I got an opportunity, I could make a difference. And so when I came in, I was undersized. I was 200 pounds. I think I graduated high school at 185. I played as a true freshman at like 195. And, and there was games where I just flat out got my butt kicked. And, um, so that, you know, going back after my freshman year, going into the weight room and growing, you know, maturing as a person, as an athlete and as a football player um, really helped. But, you know, I don't know if I revolutionized the tight end position, but I think I showed, you know, coaches that you can do certain things with the tight end that maybe they didn't think was possible. You know, like I got split out, I got put in the bad backfield um, and then played off the you know, motioned and as you know, the H back position. So I did a lot of stuff, but you know, it was, it was, I had a coach that was young and he, an offensive coordinator that was young and he was, he was doing what was best um, with his personnel wise, not what fit, you know, what he thought was the best offense. So he actually pretty much developed me into, you know, showing me new things, working with me and then asking me to do things that I wasn't comfortable with, but later got comfortable with. So, um, you know, and as far as Carroll college going, preparing for the NFL, I don't know if anything can prepare you for the NFL because when you get there, I mean, everybody's the best of the best. Everybody's fast. Everybody's strong. and Everybody's talented. And so what separates you is doing the right things, not messing up and, and being, you know, reliable, and giving your your team the op- a chance to win, so that's where you know. And I think at Carroll College, we when I came in there, we were five hundred my freshman year, and then went to the semis, the 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 my sophomore junior year, and then won it, the national championship my senior year. And so learning how to be successful and stuff like that, but also going through the ups and downs, and 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 just growing as a player. So. 
when you know you were signed right after your senior year by the Lions, an undrafted free agent in uh, 2003, were, were the Lions uh, one of the teams that was really, really interested from the get-go? Were they always coming out to your games, or was this just something that you learned you know, a couple days after the draft that, hey, the Lions are going to uh, sign me? Well, we were just uh, – you know, Carroll College was a stop between – Bozeman and Missoula or Missoula to Bozeman for these scouts. So I had all 32 scouts come out and look at me. Um, to be honest with you, I think every team had an idea of me just being a camp body and going in and being a tight end. And then um, goes back to getting an opportunity. And so I got an opportunity. I picked Detroit just because the roster looked, you know, not as strong as the other teams, you know, like Minnesota, uh, the Saints, those guys looked at me, you know, fairly heavy. And uh, but looking at the roster and and, and then Mariucci coming in in a West Coast offense um, using an H back tight end, it really fit what I was good at doing. And I know when I got to Detroit, you know, my first couple of days, I raised some eyebrows, and then they really took a strong look at me. And but I think going in there, they just kind of assumed that I was probably going to be like a camp body. So, yeah, I mean, through training camp, you know, you're able to impress those coaches, earn a spot on the 53-man roster, and then you started 11 games your rookie year. You know, how does, how does a guy from a tiny NAIA school in, in Montana, you know, start 11 games in, in the NFL as his rookie season, too? Well, I'm sure that was a great process there. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was kind of surprised. You know, we'd go through the first 15 before the game, and when we came into our two tight end set, which was, I think, is our ace package back then. Um, I was, I was kind of like, wow, I'm going to start tomorrow, and it was kind of a, you know, it was a reward for the work that I'd put in and and whatnot. You know, at rookie camp, I was the only tight end, and I was taking every single tight end snap, and we were running a two tight or a single tight end, a base package the whole camp, and so, um, you know all that work and all that prep and, and whatnot really was, it was a reward to start. And, you know, starting for me, wasn't anything. My, my biggest thing for me was to contribute in any possible way I can, whether it be an offense on special teams. And so um, just to be able to, to, to contribute was, was a big highlight for me. Talking to Casey Fitzsimmons, former Lions tight end from 2003 to 2009. You know, you, you talk about special teams, and uh, you were a key contributor on special teams during your career for the Lions, including your your uh, special teams highlight, I guess, uh, is returning a uh, – having a kick return for a touchdown against the Bears in, in 2007. I don't see many tight ends, you know, back that deep, uh, co- you know, covering kicks. So you know, what was it for you, uh, you know, to, to be on special teams and uh, have a big role like that? You know, I loved it because it was a street fight. You know, I don't think people understand special teams is a big part, in the, especially in the NFL. It, it is, the, you know, I would say a big contributor on what whether you win or lose games is, is your special teams play. You see the top-notch teams, they have solid special teams. Um, their special teams coaches play a big part in, 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 in the makeup of the coaching. Um but to, to be able to go down there, and it, it's one-on-one. I mean, it's you versus the guy next to you. You run down. You, you either beat your guy, make the tackle, or you get blocked. Or you block your guy, and he doesn't make the tackle. And so there's so much so much to special teams, and I loved it. Um, and I love playing with those core guys because, I mean, most of the special teams players are backups, and they are guys, you know, just trying to make a name for themselves and, and, and to hold on to a roster spot. So – to be a part of it with them was it was was special, and you know going on that 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 onside kickoff uh, touchdown, um, you know the special teams coach. He, I don't think he was real happy, you know, because we just cover it up and 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 the game's over. But when the I got a short hop, a candy hop, and I looked up and there was nobody there. Corey Smith set a huge block on the outside. So did Boss Bailey, and. Uh, I just took off. And when there was no one in front of me, I was like, man, we're going to score, seal it. And, and, and I remember the special teams coach, Chuck Prefer, when I got to the sideline, kind of like looked at me and, and whatnot, but he was happy, but he couldn't really say nothing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's awesome for sure. But uh, 
No, so I mentioned it before. You did play with Dan Campbell uh, for all three of the seasons that he was in Detroit uh, from 2006 to 2008. You know, uh, he was also a tight end with you. So you were in all those, those meetings together and all that. And obviously the new Lions head coach. So what was your relationship like with Dan Campbell? And, you know, what did you think of him as a player? And, and what do you think he's going to really bring to this Lions team now that he's the head coach? Out of all the guys I've played with, Dan Campbell was by far the, 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 the best pro I've ever been around. His game prep, his, his um, film study to working out, the guy is a true professional. And I don't know if I would be where, you know, had as long of a career as I did without Dan because Dan showed me so many things. And Dan's a no-excuse guy. Even when it was his fault, he would always take the blame and, or when it wasn't, he would always take the blame. I mean, the guy is just a true professional. And he's the guy, Detroit's going to love this guy. I mean, as far as, I mean, if you look at his opening press conference, I mean, I called him up and told him, hell, I want I want to come back and play for you. That's, I mean, he had me excited. And I haven't even thought about football since I left in 2010. So um, to be able to, 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 to feel his energy, his passion, um, his football knowledge is off the charts. You know, everybody's like, well, he's a tight ends coach, you know, and, but the guy is brilliant. He'll tell you exactly what the O-line's doing. He'll tell you what the receivers, he'll tell you what the backs. I mean, he's just, his football IQ is off the charts. And then his uh, trust with his players is going to be top notch. So he's a guy that the players are going to absolutely love and he's going to reward him, but he's going to have some tough love too. So I absolutely love Dan Campbell. I love what he brings to the table. I think that it's what the the city of Detroit needs, and I think they're going to be happy with what they got. And so um, I can't wait to see what they, they do. You know, it takes a little bit to build a team in the NFL, so it's not going to happen overnight. But here in the year or two when he can get his, you know, this year's draft class, draft class, and then next year's draft class implemented into a system, I think you're going to see – a really, really competitive football team. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see the playoffs here and, and uh, the 2021 season. So, you know, it's, you, you talked about it really hard to build an NFL team, but hopefully uh, Dan Campbell can turn that around. That's for sure. But, you know, you did, you did play on some of those really, really tough years uh, in Detroit, especially the, uh, the Owen 16 season. I mean, just from your experience, you know, what, what happened with that? You know, what was, you know, what was the reasons behind, you know, a, a lot of the, the misfortunes that the Lions had during, you know, some of the years that you were there? You know, there's, it was a combination of a bunch of things, you know, um, poor drafting. Um, you know, the one thing that that's always been steady and I think people beat up the Ford family on the Lions and the Ford family is the most loyal um, honest people in the business. And I think to, to a fault that extent, but I think it was just, there was some people in the position of, you know, running the team, um, outside of the Ford family that, that I just, you know, they're at fault. I mean, you can look at, I mean, look at draft class, right? So how many of those guys were, had, two year, three year careers. I mean, you can't go with your first round picks and second, third and fourth. And, and if they're not there for four, you know, through at least a a rookie contract, then you're probably doing something wrong. So there was a combination of a a bunch of things. And, you know, I think character, I mean, there's a lot of guys that were super talented, but character wise weren't very good. So, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of things, and I think it all just kind of snowballed downhill and, and guys packed in shop on the 0-16 team. And, and um, you know, you look back and you look at a guy like Jeff Backus. Jeff Backus, has he, had he been on any other team besides the Lions, would be, you know, a six, seven year all pro guy. I mean, he was outstanding. I mean, he was asked to do a lot, and uh, he, he was an iron man of football. And you got Dominic Rayola. Um, I mean, there's there's a number of guys that were just unbelievable, but we just couldn't put it together. And whether that was coaching, uh, front office, you know, I, I really couldn't put a finger on it, um, nor would I even call them out if they were, because it's, I mean, it all showed up all at once. So, I mean, the players are to blame, the front office is to blame, coaching's to blame, so... 
there's a there's a pile of things that happened that just didn't work out. After so after that 0 16 season, uh, you know, Lions get the number one overall pick, um, and they go with you know they, they go with the franchise quarterback Matthew Stafford. You actually had uh, the good fortunes of playing with him your last season in the NFL, his rookie year. And what was your first impression of Matthew Stafford? Uh, you know, walking into to training camp that year with him, and uh, you know, playing with him. I know he was hurt a lot that first year, and also you know now he's going to be with the the Rams. What 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 are the Rams going to be getting in him as well? I mean, they're getting one of the best quarterbacks in the league. I mean, the guy is super, super talented. He was making throws that were unbelievable. And, I mean, pinpoint accuracy, touch. He could throw the deep ball. He could do it all. And and, he, and he's tough. I mean, let's be honest. The guy took a punishment and a glutton of hits through his time in Detroit. And, and he played all the time. And so, um, you know, he got banged up his rookie year, but he still played. And still played at a, a a high level, and so I mean the Rams are going to be, you know, he's he's the guy. <laughs> unfortunately, had he not been to Detroit, might be you know would have been a, a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean the guy's an unbelievable football player. Football IQ is super super high. Um, leadership is unbelievable. His uh, and this is just one year of playing with him as a rookie. I mean I looked at him and and, and respected the guy um and he's just a good human being so um you know he's he's i probably got four or five maybe six years left and and but he's he's as talented as they get and i think he's one of the better quarterbacks that have come out of college football in the last decade um it's just the team he was on and what he had to kind of go through um but no i'm excited for him um that he gets a chance to hopefully go deep in the playoffs and maybe even win a Super Bowl. Speaking of uh, very talented players, one of his most talented weapons uh, that he ever had and in NFL history, Calvin Johnson, he's just getting into the Hall of Fame this year on, on his first ballot. You played with him from 2007 to 2009, his first three seasons uh, in the league. What did you see from Megatron, uh, you know, that you know, right from the get-go that he was going to be a, a Hall of Fame player like, like, like he is today? Well, watching him come into the weight room when Coach Marinelli got there the first year and, and retested us all and watching him jump, I think, like a 42-inch vertical just straight out of the locker room, um, watching his catching, his his catch radius is off the charts. I mean, you could throw a ball six, seven feet away from him, and he's going to find a way to catch it. So the guy is unbelievable. Uh sometimes, you know, in the NFL, you see a lot of talented people, but to to sit there and practice and watch what Calvin did and just be in awe of it is, is pretty impressive. I mean, he is deservingly so, you know, maybe a top 10 receiver to ever play in the NFL and um, just an unbelievable person. You know, he's a great teammate. He was a great leader. He, uh, he was accountable. He did everything right. I mean, there, there's no more. There's no one more deserving than Calvin Johnson to go in as a first ballot Hall of Famer, and uh, to be able to play with him, to still, you know, um, stay in contact with him, and and he's just a good her- human being, and and uh, he was impressive. He's probably, in my opinion, watching and what I took away is probably the most impressive football player that I was ever around. Wow, that's. Saying a lot for one of the, the greatest football players uh, to ever play the game, Calvin Johnson. But, Casey, I wanted to end uh, on a really uh, a kind of a high note, a, a fun note. So I know in the past you've com- you've compared Montana to some parts of Michigan before. You know, of course, uh, the outdoors and, and the hunting and all that. When you played here in Detroit, did you ever get the chance to go up north uh, to, you know, the beautiful uh, up north of Michigan and, and uh, the, the nice woods up there and a lot of great hunting spots? Did you ever, uh, did you ever get to do that? Oh yeah, I, I I was any chance I got, I was out exploring Michigan. Whether it was hunting deer, um, fishing, um, doing what we called it Rubik Ball, where we'd go around, travel, and play basketball, and raise money for uh, the police association or fire departments. Um, I'd go out all over Michigan. I love Michigan. I love the people of Michigan. Um, I love the state of Michigan. I think it's, and I always refer to it. I hope nobody from Michigan takes offense to this, but it's just a poor man montana you know as far as scenery um um outdoor you know fish and hunting activities and and whatnot 
but the people of Michigan are a lot like Montanans. They're resilient, they're tough, they're blue collar and they go to work. And, um, it was a great fit for me. And, and, and Northern Michigan's got its own beauty, the lakes. Um, I love the hardwoods of Michigan. I love the farms. Um, you know, so there's a lot there that, that, that I can compare to Montana and, and I really appreciated my time there. Do you ever uh, get to know Rob Rubick, a former Lions tight end? We've had him on the podcast, too. He uh, worked for Fox Sports Detroit up from uh, – he's from the Upper Peninsula. Do you ever get to uh, meet up with him at all up there? Well, yeah, Rob's from Lapeer. And Rob mm-hmm. Rubick and I are real good friends. Rob's actually going to come out to Montana, him and his wife, Deb, um, and hang out and, and whatnot. But, no, Rob's like a – was like a dad for me out there. He, 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 I would go over to his house on days off and, and spend time with him eat dinner, got to know his kids and, uh, he's just a good person. And Michigan is fortunate to have a guy like that, that loves the lions, loves football. And, um, and he does an honest evaluation on everybody, you know, but I always have to give him crap that I was, you know, a better tight end than him. And he just hasn't quite swallowed that yet. Very funny stuff. We've had a Rob Rubick uh, on the podcast before as well. But thank you again uh, to Casey, uh, you know, the Lions tight end from uh, 2003 to 2009. Uh, you're also in the Montana Football Hall of Fame and the, the Carroll College uh, Athletic Hall of Fame as well. Casey, thanks again for joining us here. Thanks for having me. I want to thank Casey Fitzsimmons again for coming on to the podcast. How about that? A, a rancher out in Montana now has over 250 cattle. That's uh, quite impressive there. It's a big business out there in the, the state of Montana. And, you know, his experience is playing with Matthew Stafford, Calvin Johnson. I mean, it, it's it's incredible. Dan, Dan Campbell. I mean, he had nothing but great things to say about Dan Campbell and the direction of the organization right now. That's for sure. And, you know, a guy that played seven years, all seven of his years in the NFL were with the Lions. So in, in his love for up north, too, I thought that was really interesting as well. All right. I wanted to end really quickly on a little note from the weekend about the Lions. And it actually refers to a statistical champion, a new statistical champion in the NFL, Al Bubba Baker. Uh, according to some research with Pro Football Reference, has been named the official champion, uh, the the single-season sack champion in NFL history. Now, remember 1999, Michael Strahan, that was the 22 and a half sacks. That was the NFL record. But Bubba Baker now, with some research from 1970s, 1978, he had 23 sacks, so a half sack more than Strahan did. The NFL officially started taking sack stats as an official stat in 1982. Before that, Teams would take stats uh, sacks on their own. You know, they would they would take stats, and it wasn't considered an official stat. It was basically on a team by team basis. So, with but with some research that Pro Football Reference did, and I, I look I, I look at that website all the time. I love their uh, the in depth stats that they have, and and you know the historical stats because they I, I like how they compile the stats from that were not official before you know, the the year that they became official because it, it helps me kind of measure some of the older players from a statistical standpoint when stats weren't official. So uh, Bubba Baker, I mean, that's really cool. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's awesome that finally he gets some recognition because I think Bubba Baker is one of the more underrated defensive ends of his time. I mean, he hits, you guys got to remember, he played five seasons for the Lions. He had 75 and a half sacks in five seasons with the Lions. I mean... That's that's an average of fifth, almost fifteen a season. So a guy that was very very underrated for his time, the uh, the silver rush or the silver crush uh, was uh, the, the defensive line of the the late seventies in Detroit. So congratulations to Bubba Baker for uh, officially becoming the uh, the statistical champion for single season sacks. Just just thought that was that was pretty cool. Plus he uh, he owns a, a barbecue business now. He was on uh, the the show Shark Tank for boneless ribs. It was getting me hungry. I was watching some of those videos. I thought, oh my gosh, boneless ribs. I don't, I don't have to make a mess anymore. I can just use a fork and knife. <laughs> Bubba Baker into the barbecue business, just like a Billy Sims, uh, f- another former lion. So hopefully everybody enjoyed the podcast today. Make sure to check out all the other great content on the network, the Doc and Jack podcast, the wrestling podcast, the Michigan podcast, the fan report. All really, really good stuff and really good content that we have on the on the network. And I've been a part of it now for over a year. 
really, really enjoyed getting a, a, a lot of guests on. Like like a Casey Fitzsimmons, a guy that was in the locker room, that was in Allen Park, that was there every day. You know, with Dan Campbell, knows him really well. So uh, and uh, you know, a guy that really uh, he wanted to play for him. You know, right away he called him up, said, "Hey, I want to play for you." So I mean, that's uh, that's the kind of energy that Dan Campbell uh, hopefully will bring to the Lions. And we're going to be starting training camp up really soon. Make sure to check out all of John Macaroon's great content with SI Lions as well. And uh, we'll hear from you guys next week, only on Open Mic Night.